Welcome to our fourth dialogue, The War and the World. Uh, ISPI, as many other think tanks, has been covering the war in Ukraine minute by minute, day by day. But on top of that, with The War and the World, we have asked 10 prominent speakers to look just around the corner and see what the near future holds for global politics, economics and other relevant areas. Today, I have the great pleasure to talk about the future of financial stability with Jean-Claude Trichet, former president of the European Central Bank and before of the Banque de France. Thank you, Mr. Trichet. Thank you, Jean-Claude, for being with us. Uh, it's a real pleasure. Uh, we will get immediately into uh, issues like finance and currency and inflation, but let me start with you with uh, a general assessment of what we are experiencing. Uh, if you had to single out one thing that this conflict has changed, what would you mention and what would you expect as a possible end game at this point? Thank you very much first, uh, dear Paolo, for uh, inviting me to exchange some views with you. I appreciate enormously for all reasons you, you know. Uh, let me only say that in my opinion, this is of course an absolute drama for confidence, confidence in Europe and confidence, global confidence, confidence uh, in the world. We have the first war, the real first war in uh, Europe uh, since uh, World War II, uh, uh, an event that was considered absolutely impossible before. So I expect a dramatic change of, uh, I would say, the attitude of uh, fellow citizens, uh, not only in Europe, in the rest of the world, of uh, investors, savers, market participants, uh, all those who are making up the future of our countries, uh, continents, and, uh, and uh, of course, the global, uh, the global uh, evolution. And I, I would characterize uh, the, the situation, the present situation as dramatic loss of confidence first, and also, dramatic uncertainty because we don't know where we go. It seems to me that we are really at crossroads and one cannot exclude a new division of the planet between two blocks or two, two categories of alliances. I don't exclude that and this would be an absolute drama from my own standpoint. I have to say also from the ESP standpoint from absolutely all uh, the uh, angle of vision we, we could have. So I will stop there. Thank you. That's a lot already. <laughs> uh, sanctions is the topic, uh, new sanctions is the topic, one of the topic of the day, new arms, new sanction. And most countries are taking unprecedented sh sanctions against Russia. Are they really working? Well, first of all, I would say that uh, sanctions are always uh, um, a coin with uh, uh, two faces. Uh, of course, uh, it is uh, perfectly appropriate in the circumstances where the behavior of Russia was abominable, still is, and we are, by the day, discovering that it is even worse than what was trusted. Uh, that being said, of course, the sanctions are also hitting those who are embarking sanctions, and the Europeans know that better than anybody because they are the first to suffer from the sanctions, taking into account their dependency on Russia and also on Ukraine in some respect, uh, in many, many domains, particularly, of course, oil and gas. And uh, uh, the uh, difficulty is that uh, all European countries are not hit in the same fashion. So solidarity between European countries is of the essence also in this domain. Uh, let me pursue a little bit, two or three remarks on the sanctions. I have experienced myself sanctions that were decided on Poland by the West uh, at the moment where uh, General Jaruzelski took over. After a number of years, the West decided that it was no good to continue with those sanctions 
because it was playing also against the West. And I was, I was a chairman of the Paris Club at the time. I had to go in Versailles to renew relationship with the very same government, the communist government of Jaruzelski. So I experienced myself the complexity of the sanctions, depending on how things are moving and also the changes of the overall uh, political attitude of uh, the various partners concerned. So I mentioned that en passant. As regards the present sanctions, I think uh, most of them are absolutely appropriate. I have an hesitation on something like the free, absolute freezing of all central bank assets. Uh, I am not sure that it will not play against the West, quote unquote, taking into account that if those assets are not secure, it is a formidable incentive for a number of countries which are more or less uh, either adverse to the West or neutral, quote unquote. They could say, well, we are uh, safer if we don't embark on the utilization of the uh, US dollar or Euro currencies. And uh, uh, we, we are better off if we turn out towards a totally different universe with all the consequences that I'm back to square one when I said I, the, the, the worst thing which could happen on the planet would be the split between two blocks. That would be a total catastrophe. And we have to, in my opinion, avoid that even if the circumstances are absolutely dramatic as they are today. And that means keeping an eye on China, mainly China and India, to prevent enlarging this conflict. Uh, inflation was already at record high. Uh, is it now here to stay and probably coupled with low growth? And if so, what is the best answer government can provide to support businesses and families now? Well, f f first of all, uh I would say that the war in Ukraine uh, is uh, terrible because it comes after a sequence of uh, uh, global crises, European crises, that uh, were uh, uh, accumulating and piling up, I would say, vulnerabilities and difficulties of all kinds. Uh, I, of course, refer to Lehman Brothers a long time ago and to the COVID-19, which is more or less uh, still in place, if I may even if we, we can now uh, think that uh, we are uh, going out. So it's on top of that, on top of a situation of extremely great vulnerabilities that we have a war in Ukraine. And of course, inflation is uh, something which we have to take into account because that after the long period of very low inflation and the threat of uh, deflation that was uh, justifying extraordinary accommodating monetary policies. We are now before the war in Ukraine with a big jump of inflation. Uh, in February, we had uh, in Europe 5.9% headline inflation and uh, something like 2.7% uh, core inflation. So something which was very, very high. And of course, the most recent figures we have are worse because of the war in Ukraine and the, the peak and the surge of prices of oil, of, uh, of uh, gas, of commodities uh, in general, and also of uh, agro, uh, uh, agricultural production. So all that puts headline in March at the level of 7.5% and core at the level of 3%. So only, only to have that in mind, core today, I mean March, is 3% in, your, in, the Euro, in the Euro area. Core in March 21 was 0.9%. So it was multiplied by three, a little bit more than three. Something considerable, frankly speaking. We are changing totally uh, our own universe. Only to nuance a little bit, I would say it's worse in the US it works in the UK. So we have also to take that into account. In the US, uh, core inflation 
is uh, something like 6.4 percent and core inflation in the uk 5.2 percent so you you see we are in a very very bad situation core is clearly out of our definition of price stability of our goal of two percent still we are not in the worst position amongst the advanced economy but that of course calls for extreme vigilance in my opinion from the central bank because the central bank is responsible for the anchoring of inflation expectations medium term in line of course with our definition of price stability two percent if inflation is not anchored then we are going uh, in a permanent inflation with all the consequences that we know by the past namely it is adverse for every citizen in the country's concern in the continent concern it's dramatic and it uh, terminates by a recession now you spoke of stagflation i can go back to that if you wish J just one word on on stagflation uh, it seems to me that uh, uh, we were going and uh, the ecb was uh, particularly keen on mentioning the fact that uh, we had uh, uh, growth uh, which was uh, forecasted uh, uh, for uh, for this year and next year uh, but growth now is uh, something which uh, uh, will certainly be revised down very very strongly i i expect myself that uh, the, the 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 both influence of uh, a uh, big increase of the price of oil and commodity, which has always both, I would say, an inflationary impact and a depressionary impact. Uh, we might expect, it's my own judgment at the moment I'm speaking, minus 1.4% growth in comparison with the previous uh, projections and based by scenario, which would put the 3.7 that we were expecting for, for this year at the level of, say, 2.3%, much less flattering, still growth. And maybe I'm too optimistic there, but I would dare say I don't expect recession for this year or even stagnation for this year in Europe. I think that the inertia of growth that we had accumulated is would be sufficient, I hope, uh, to put us at the very, very negative scenario that was a uh, uh, projected by the staff of the ECB and even a little worse than the negative scenario because the negative scenario was 2.5 growth this year instead of the 2.3 I, I mentioned. I expect, I hope also that uh, we, it won't be worse than that. That being said, of course, it's very bad news, very bad news for, uh, for Europe as a whole. I, I mentioned the loss of confidence in my first uh, response to your first question. I would say that you have also to price that in. If there is a continuing loss of confidence because of the abomination that are taking place in Ukraine, I don't exclude, of course, that it would be even much worse because confidence is of the essence for, in any economy, of course, and particularly in the UN. Thank you. Uh, let me now move to debt. We are getting to the end of our conversation. But first, we had more public spending to face COVID-19, now more public spending to face the war, refugees, defense, debt after debt. Is a new financial crisis around the corner? I remember I, I had the same question during COVID. <laughs> I was asking you uh, if the, a new financial crisis was around the corner, but now we had on top of what we spent on COVID, what we plan to spend on the war uh, and all we, all we had already spend it, spent? Yes, well, uh, clearly uh, uh, I was mentioning the piling up of vulnerabilities since uh, uh, 15 years, since uh, Lehman Brothers and the subprime. Uh, this piling up is very visible in the global debt itself, which uh, uh, suggests that the global situation from the financial and from the uh, overall, I would say, uh, stock of debt vulnerability is much, much 
higher vulnerability, much higher than uh, before the subprime crisis, because you had the accumulation of the subprime and demand crisis, plus the long period of very, very low inflation and permanent threat of deflation, which marked the period of the central banks after I left myself the ECB, and which was, uh, you know, calling for extraordinary, uh, I would say, uh, accommodation in order to prevent the materialization of the deflationary risk. And then uh, we had accumulated new debt and uh, uh, new, I would say, efforts made both by the central banks and by the governments in the advanced economy and also at the rest of the world level. And then we had the COVID and COVID was justifying, again, you just mentioned it. So we are really in a situation which is, in my opinion, very grave, obviously, in the, the debt uh, uh, dimension. And uh, more generally, uh, this debt dimension, this also over-assessment of the uh, assets in general, at the global level and in the advanced economy in particular, stocks and shares uh, very, very high historically, probably much too high. All this happens at a moment where the monetary policies are necessarily changing because we have inflation and the, material, the threat of materialization of the inflationary risk, the reverse of the previous 10 years uh, risk we had. And we have also from that standpoint, of course, uh, the uh, element which uh, we should uh, not uh, forget that the uh, green transition, which is a new challenges, uh, not a new, but a challenges, which is putting its own mark on the present situation. This green transition will probably call for real interest rates to go higher. So not only we will have the nominal interest rates going higher because of inflation, but real interest rates because of the, uh, I would say, savings glut, which will disappear with all the investment that are associated, the massive investment associated with the green transition. So I see the present period extremely difficult, calling a very high level of responsibility for all, of course, public authorities on the one hand, and also uh, all private, if I may, responsible entities on the other hand. It's for all of us to be fully aware of the gravity of the present situation. And again, at a global level, not only at the level of Europe or of the advanced economies. Thank you, dear Jean-Claude. I would close our conversation with this call for responsibility you just uh, uh, had and uh, I thank you very much for being with us uh, as always very useful and uh, useful insight. Merci. It was a great, great pleasure Paolo. Thank you very much for your invitation.